So, hello and welcome to this NPTEL course in title 20th Century Fiction, uh, where we're looking at James Joyce's novel Ulysses. So, in the last session, we talked about the anti Semiticism in Ulysses, how um, the hatred of Jews, the xenophobia against Jews, is displayed in a very little dramatic scene, but uh, the conversation in, in Stephen T. Dallas and the headmaster of a school in which he works. Uh, and we saw how that xenophobia, in terms of you know, conferring every negative aspect on the Jewish presence, uh, how they bring in degeneration, how they bring in uh, a decline in culture, civilization, etc., was very much part of the contemporary Dublin culture, contemporary Anglo Saxon culture, even in England. Uh, that kind of a sentiment was quite rampant. Uh, so, that little political bit in Ulysses is quite interesting, and not least because the protagonist of Ulysses, so at least one of the two protagonists in Ulysses, uh, Leopold Bloom, uh, happens to be a Jew as well. So, in this section, we will start with the Leopold Bloom, the first time he's introduced in a novel. Uh, and how we look at how the entire space around Bloom is basically something which informs its character and also the character of Dublin, which navigates through its musings and its walkings. Uh, and we see the section over here, we find how consumption becomes a very important uh, metaphor over here. There's a lot of talk about food and consumption and eating. Uh, and obviously, that's related to bodily movements. And we find later on uh, Bloom, the very graphic description of Bloom uh, defecating. Uh, so, again, different kinds of bodily movements, consuming, defecating, digesting, indigestion. So, all these are displayed in um, very visceral and graphic details in Ulysses. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of this novel, uh, when we started reading, reading this, uh, one of the things which this novel does is that it foregrounds the body and the bodily sensations and the different kinds of bodily functions and makes it a part of his realism. So, the body becomes very much part of the realist narrative in Ulysses, which is obviously part of his uh, scandal, part of his shock package, uh, the reason why it got, it, it aroused such a massive scandal in his contemporary times. Now, we see in this section, uh, Leopold Bloom is introduced along with Molly Bloom, his wife. And, and as I mentioned, there's a very superficial, uh, you know, adherence to the original Homer myth, uh, the Homer story, the Homer epic of uh, Odysseus. Uh, so, Bloom uh, over here is obviously Ulysses. Uh, you know, Stephen did that as Stellamachus, Ulysses' son, uh, with whom they have a very strange relationship, a very s strained relationship, uh, if one, one may say so, between the father and son. And Molly Bloom over here is uh, Penelope, uh, where well, the difference being the Penelope in Homer's Odysseus was a faithful wife, whereas Molly Bloom over here, uh, you know, he, she chooses to be unfaithful to uh, her husband. And that unfaithfulness is very much, again, part of the scandal. Uh, that Ulysses has managed to arouse. Uh, so, we see in this very section where Bloom appears for the first time, we see the different kinds of food metaphors used uh, in very graphic details, especially meat metaphors, different kinds of meat are being consumed. And again, um, this constant connection to Jewishness is something which we uh, never should never lose sight of uh, in this section, especially in this section as it's foregrounded. So, this should be on the screen and we'll just read out certain sections before we begin to unpack those in some details. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. So, the very first sentence has almost like a cannibalistic quality, right? So, he eats with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. It's almost like a carnivore or cannibal. Uh, so, the consumption narrative is very much foregrounded in Ulysses. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liversils uh, fried with um, crust crumbs, fried hencots, rares. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. So, again, look at the way in which excretion, consumption, different kinds of bodily functions are not just foregrounded, they're almost celebrated. They're described in such graphic, visceral details that it is meant to shock you, it's also meant to move you, uh, sometimes in repulsion, sometimes in a disgust. And in this sense, uh, Joyce is very close to one of his Irish uh, you know, ancestors, literary ancestors, uh, that is Jonathan Swift. If you read Jonathan Swift's uh, Gulliver's Travels, for instance, even Modest Proposal, we find that even Swift is a master satirist. And part of his satire relied on the bodily functions. So, the shock that Swift created was again produced through different kinds of visceral corporeal functions. And the corporeality in Ulysses is very much part of his realism, as I just mentioned. Uh, so, the body is foregrounded, the body is displayed, the body functions are celebrated and constantly described in graphic detail. So, excretion uh, in the excretory system, the digestive system, the, all these are constantly talked about uh, as if we get up 
inside into the inner organs of uh, Bloom himself. Okay, so again, different kinds of meat things, uh, the fact that he eats inner organs of bees and fowls, uh, that is meant to shock and uh, create disgust. And also, it's very much part of the gritty realism that Julius seeks to achieve and obviously manages to achieve with great success uh, in terms of his location and description of Dublin. Kidneys were in mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on a humpy tray. Gathered light and air were in the kitchen, but out of door, gentle summer morning everywhere made him feel a bit peckish. So again, hunger becomes uh, you know, part of the description over here. So e everything around him, the, the um, bit of an uncouth kitchen over here, he's trying to set up the uh, breakfast for him, himself and his wife. And the, the, now it's the day is about, about to break in over here. Uh, but the gentle summer morning is coming in and all that is making him a bit peckish or hungry. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter, three, four, right. She didn't like a plate full, right. He turned from the tray, lifted the kettle of the herb and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there, dull and squat. Its spout stuck up. Cup of tea soon. Good. Mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly around the leg of a table with tail on high. So again, look at the uh, almost automatic association that the thought processes achieve away uh, to a certain extent, right? So there's this degree of association, the degree of uh, automatism about movements, uh, almost machinic in quality. And also this is very much part of the stream of consciousness technique that the modernists use to great effect. Uh, so you have different kinds of material signifiers, each triggering different emotions and how the human subjects navigate through these emotions in a place as banal as a kitchen, right? So even the kitchen can be, the banal kitchen space can also generate a streams of consciousness to the extent that it makes people nostalgic or hungry or in a mournful or all kinds of melodic emotions can come in. Looking at certain signifiers, so a kettle can be a signifier of something, the tea of course is a very Protestant symbol of memory, but you know, everything around him in the kitchen, uh, it obviously adds to the sensory economy. Uh, it becomes a very sensuous sensory economy which arouses certain feelings in him, uh, hunger being one of those at the moment. Okay, um, right. Um, and the milk metaphor comes back again. He, we, we see how he has a little conversation with the cat, tries to give him some milk, give her some milk, and takes a jug Hanlon's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm bubbled milk on a saucer and set it slowly on the floor. Girl, she cried, run into lab. He watched the bristles shining wearily in the weak light as she tipped three times and licked lightly. Wonder is it true if you clip them, they can't mouse after. Why? They shine in the dark, perhaps, the tips or kind of feelers in the dark perhaps. And again, look at the uh, language use over here. So, uh, one bubbled milk. Again, one bubble isn't really a word, uh, but it gives you the effect. The, the real temperature of the, uh, the milk has been conveyed to us using and one of those joys and words where words are coined together, are put together and in the process, a different kind of effective word is being produced. Uh, and also, uh, the whole idea of the, uh, the cats, you know, mousing uh, is obviously meaning it seems to convey that they are able to hunt down mouse uh, or mice for the matter. Uh, so mouse becomes a verb away here. So to mouse something is to kill a mouse and that's the whole purpose of having a cat in a domestic setting. Okay, uh, on quietly creaky boots he went up the staircase to the hall, pose for the bedroom door. She might like something tasty, thin bread and butter she likes in the morning, still perhaps once in a way. He said softly in the bare hall, I'm going around the corner, I'll be back in a minute. So he goes out to buy some, you know, some kidney uh, from a nearby shop, some ne nearby meat shop. And again, uh, the gritty realism of Dublin will be conveyed very, very soon. He's, he's going to walk down Dublin streets and he'll walk down to a butcher shop, a Jewish butcher shop. And we see the irony of the Jewish butcher shop in the sense that the butcher sells certain kinds of meat, uh, which is non-kosher, which he cannot himself consume, uh, being a Jew. And when he heard his voice, when he had heard his voice uh, say it, he added, uh, you don't want anything for breakfast. A sleepy, soft grunt answered, mm, no, she didn't want anything. She, he heard then a warm, heavy sigh, softer, as she turned over and the loose brass quoits of the bedstead jingled. Must get those settled, really, pity, all the way from Gibraltar, forgotten any little Spanish she knew. Wonder what her father gave for it, old style, oh yes, of course. Bought it at the governor's auction, got a short knock. Uh, hard uh, nails uh, at a bargain, old Twitty, yes sir, at Flemina it was, I rose from the ranks sir, and I'm proud of it, still he had brains enough to make the corner and stamps, now that was far seeing. So we get a very series, interesting series of information about Molly Bloom over here. We get to know that he, she, she grew up in Gibraltar, which is again interesting because that connects up to the original Homeric narrative where Gibraltar features, the, that geopolitical location features quite heavily as a voyage metaphor, as a voyage marker. 
uh, in Homer's Odysseus. So the fact that she comes from Gibraltar uh, makes her slightly exotic in Dublin, uh, but at the same time she's very much a Dubliner over here. His hand took his hat from the peg over his in, in, initial uh, heavy overcoat and his lost property offers um, second hand waterproofs. So again, uh, the sartorial signifiers are very important. Uh, he's got an initial heavy overcoat which is presumably uh, not very cheap, maybe pay some money for it because he has his initial in his own name. And but the uh, waterproof he wears on top of that is a lost property office second hand waterproof. So waterproof was someone lost presumably and something which he bought from that office uh, after a period of time. Stamps, sticky back pictures, they said lots of officers are in the swim too, of course I do. The sweated legend on the crown of his hat told him mutely, plus to his high grade hair. He peeped inside, um, uh, he peep, peeped quickly inside the leather, uh, the leather handband, quite slip of paper, quite safe. On the doorstep he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key. Not there, in the trousers or left top, must get it, potato or have, creaky wardrobe, no use disturbing her, she turned over sleepily at that time. He pulled the holder uh, to him, to after him very quietly, no, still the foot, foot leaf dropped gently over the threshold, a limp lid, look shut, all right till I come back anyhow. So again, look at the very short sentences, which is obviously part of the stream of consciousness technique, which have this very associative effect. So one thought associates itself with another thought, and hence we have this winding sentences coupled with the short sentences put together in a very incompatible mixture of different kinds of sentences. But the incompatibility is exactly the point, because that's exactly how authentically the human thought processes occur. The human thought processes don't have a logical sequence, they don't really have a symmetrical sequence. They have short thoughts and long thoughts put together in a very interesting entanglements which is exactly what's happening here okay right and then we have a description of uh, his uh, walk down Dublin he approached Larry uh, Larry oral keys from the cellar grating uh, floated up the flabby gush of porter uh, through the open doorway the bar squirted out whiffs of ginger tea dust uh, biscuit mush Good house, however, just the end of the city traffic. For instance, uh, McCullough is down there uh, in a, a position, of course, if they ran a tram line along the north circular road from the cattle market to the quays, value would go up like a shot. Right, so again, we have this very interesting description of Dublin and little shops uh, and real estate property uh, prices at that point in time. So we have this very interesting mixture of gritty, dirty, murky and materialist realism where you have things such as property prices, tram lines coming up, all these are put together and then we have this very interesting abstract stream of consciousness with this series of abstract associations uh, with which these thought processes occur and the two intermingle with each other. And this particular passage too, this particular section where we're reading at the moment, we find out how the spiritual and the material, the spiritual and the vulgar, the spiritual and the banal, they all come together in very interesting combinations which is not quite easy to demarcate anymore. Okay, so, uh, and then the reference to the funeral comes up, the Dignam funeral, which is something which we'll do in some details later. Uh, stop and say a word about the funeral, perhaps. Sad thing about poor Dignam, Mr. Oruke. Turning to the Dorset Street, he said freshly in greeting to the doorway, Good day, Mr. Oruke. Good day to you. Lovely weather, sir. It's all that. Where do they get the money? Coming up redhead curates from the country, later in, rinsing empties an old man in the cellar. Then, lo and behold, they blossom out of the Adam Findladders or Dan, Dan Talons, the thin of the competition, general thirst. Good puzzle would be cross Dublin without passing a pub. Save it, save it the can't. All the drunks, perhaps. Put down three and carry five. What is that? A bob here and there, drifts and drafts on the wholesale wall orders, perhaps doing a double shuffle with the town travellers, square it to you with the boss and will split the job, see. So you have different kinds of voices coming in, which is interesting. Uh, these are not necessarily uh, Leopold Bloom's thoughts alone. So the, in that sense, the reason why I read it out, the seemingly nonsensical passage over here, is that this goes to show the very uh, heteroglossic quality about Ulysses. Heteroglossia obviously means many voices, or the polyphonia voices. The polyphony and heteroglossia are two very important features of Ulysses. Uh, we have many voices speaking together at the same time, which creates a sense of a swan stable like sequence uh, in Dublin. At the same time, uh, it manages to make the entire narrative quite plural and polyphonic in quality. You have different kinds of voices with different pitches, uh, sometimes battling against each other, sometimes informing each other uh, to speak out little stories which not necessarily uh, you know, rational or complete in themselves. Okay. Uh, and then we have this very visceral description of a kidney, uh, a freshly cut uh, liver, uh, presumably from, uh, you know, uh, uh, from a mutton piece. A kidney oozed blood gouts on the willow patterned dish, the last. He stood by the next door girl at the counter. Would she buy it too? Calling the items from a slip in her hand, chapped. 
washing soda and pound and a half of Denny sausages. His eyes rested on a vigorous hips. So again, look at the way in which the flesh metaphor moves from the dead meat to the human body over here uh, in a very vulgar kind of a transition. But at the same time, this vulgarity is what exactly has been conveyed over here. It's an entire mixture of different kinds of senses. So, he's a dead meat which has been chopped and he's a, the last piece of liver, the last piece of kidneys there and he's feeling a bit anxious whether a girl in the next counter might get it and he, he wants to nudge her out, elbow her out and get the last piece. But at the same time, his eyes fall on her and in a very voyeuristic kind of a way, he looks at her very, very uh, vigorous hips which is also conjoined with the different kinds of meat which is being shown in this particular window. Okay. Uh, Woods his name is, the name of the butcher is Woods, wonder what he does, wife is oldish, new blood, no followers allowed, strong pair of arms, whacking our carpet on the clothesline, she does whack it, by George, the way her crooked skirt swings at each whack. The fairy tide pot pork butcher folded the sausages he had snipped off with blotchy fingers, sausage pink, sound meat there, like a stall fed heifer. Right, so again, the meat metaphor continues away here, which is obviously it carries different functions. It carries the function of consumption, it also carries the function of deadness. Uh, everything is dead. We have the series of corpses and carcasses around, uh, which is also an extension of the corpse like quality, the sepulchre quality of Dublin. Uh, the dead quality of Dublin over here, everyone seems to be dead. Uh, human beings or human bodies are just flesh, uh, pieces of flesh walking around like carcasses over here. Okay, right. Uh, and again, uh, look at the way in which the, uh, the entire idea of the butcher, uh, the, the function of the butcher is, is manifested in a way he appears as well. The pork butcher snapped two sheets from the pile, wrapped up with prime sausages and made a red grimace. No my miss, he said. She tendered a coin, smiling boldly, holding a thick wrist out. Thank you, my miss, and one shilling three pence change uh, for you, please. Mr. Bloom pointed quickly to catch up and walk behind her if she went slowly behind the moving hams. Uh, pleasant to see first thing in the morning. Hurry up, damn it, make the hay while the sun shines. Uh, so this is obviously Bloom being a voyeur over here, Bloom being a sort of a stalker, so to speak. Uh, so he, he sees this attractive woman and he wants to follow her. Uh, he wants to follow her appearance, he wants to follow her body and he wants to gaze at her body. So the gaze obviously is very voyeuristic in quality, it's very vulgar in quality and the vulgarity and voyeurism uh, is interestingly related to the very gritty, dirty Dublin realism which Ulysses is trying to convey away. Right. Uh, hurry up, damn it, make hay while the sun shines. She stood outside the shop in sunlight and sauntered lazily to the right. He sighed up the uh, uh, side down his nose, they never understand. A sort of chapped hands, crusted toenails, toenails too, brown scapulars and tatters defending her both ways. The sting of disregard glowed to weak pleasure within his breast. For another, a constable of duty cuddling her in Eccles Lane. They like them sizable, prime sausage. Oh please, Mr. Policeman, I am lost in the wood. So again, the very vulgar metaphors of voyeurism, stalking, etc. And then this police figure comes in as a fear factor, and then a police is seen as a predator, where yeah, someone, people who predate, people who hunt a woman like this. Uh, and then the last passage, the last line over here, I'm lost in the wood. So again, I'm lost in my own chain of thoughts. I'm lost in the whole idea of directionlessness in Dublin. And then it cuts back into the, the present time. So the reverie keeps being cut back. Three pence, please. So again, he wakes up from his dirty reverie. His hand accepted the moist, tender gland and slid it into a side pocket. So again, look at the very fleshy, earthly quality about this entire exchange over here. Then he fetched up three coins from his trousers pocket and laid them on the rubber prickles. The lay were read quickly and quickly slid disc by disc into the till. Thank you, sir. Another time. A speck of eager fire from Fuchs' eyes thanked him. He withdrew his gaze after an instant. No, better not another time. Good morning, uh, he said, moving away. Good morning, sir. No sign. Gone. What matter? He walked back along Dorset Street, re reading gravely. Uh, Agadon, Nettenham, Planters Company to purchase waste sandy tracks from Turkish government and plant with eucalyptus trees. So he gets reading newspapers, the daily news of Dublin coming in, already present news, and he's reading those as he's walking back to his home. Okay. Right. Uh, and then we have this entire uh, very cinematic uh, description of the sky where you know, Bloom looks at the sky and sees a cloud began to cover the sun slowly, holy, grey, far. So the very cinematic visual narrative is being uh, you know, sort of slanting down uh, the sky and he looks at it you know, as if a camera gaze. No, not like that. A barren land, uh, bare waste, volcanic lake, the Dead Sea, no fish, wheatless, sunk deep in the earth. No wind would lift those waves, grey metal, poisonous, foggy waters, brimstone the colored raining down, the cities of Plain, uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adam. 
all dead names, a dead sea in a dead land, grey and old. So you can look at the way in which deadness comes as a mythic concept over here, uh, almost a prehistoric concept, the dead cities, uh, you know, almost the biblical cities. And that immediately cuts into the present time of dead meat, uh, of dead sausages, of dead imagination of dead Dublin. So the meat metaphor over here becomes a trigger to certain mythical landscapes which are all dead, the dead cities, and then you come back again to, and cut into present day time which is about dead Dublin, which is about the uh, almost a cannibalistic quality about dead Dublin where consuming uh, consumption becomes a form of cannibalism uh, to a certain extent. Okay, uh, and then of course we, he hurries back into Eccles Street, which is the house of uh, Leopold Bloom. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go to Dublin, you find there is actually an Eccles Street uh, where the Ulysses happens as a house of Leopold Bloom, and that's the realism of, uh, of of choice. He actually uses houses which were really there as physical presences. Okay, right. Uh, and then he comes back and picks up the letters from the Holdo, uh, Hallflow, and goes back to his wife uh, and they have a conversation about different things, about people who send letters, etc. And the passage ends with something interesting. Uh, you know, there's again this very interesting correlation between the metaphysical and the very grossly physical. Okay? So, um, uh, we are told that, you know, he's picked up a word, uh, metempsychosis, and he wants to know what that means. He wants to discuss that with his wife. Uh, metempsychosis is obviously, you know, it's like a very, uh, uh, ancient classical word about the transposition of soul, the journey of the soul, right? So that when the human being dies, the soul moves on something else, it's like a reincarnation and wants a metaphysical discussion about it with his wife, okay? And obviously, uh, that falls flat because something else happens in the kitchen and so then again, the gritty, dirty realism kicks back and it interrupts any conversation which is almost remotely metaphysical in quality, okay? And this is the conversation I wanted to highlight. Uh, show here, uh, she said, I put a mark in it. There's a word I wanted to ask you. She swallowed a drop of tea from a cup held by not handled. Again, look at the way, uh, held by not handled. Uh, uh, Joyce coins different kinds of words over here for different kind of affective uh, significance. And having wiped her fingertips smartly on the blanket, began to search the text with a hairpin till she reached the word. Again, look at the meticulous uh, description over here, almost a camera gaze into something very, very uh, close up. Met him what? He asks. Obviously, he doesn't know the word. Uh, you know, met him what? Here, she said. What does that mean? He leaned downward and read her, uh, read near the polished thumbnail. Met him psychosis. Yes. Who was he and, and when he's at home? So there's a flippant uh, address, uh, a flippant uh, response to the whole idea of met him psychosis, which is supposed to be a very, very profound metaphysical word. Now, this becomes very interesting because met him psychosis is a Greek word, which is a direct connection uh, with the Homeric landscape, uh, from which Ulysses is obviously mimicking uh, in a very postmodernist kind of a way. Metempsychosis, he said, frowning. It's Greek. From the Greeks, that means the transmigration of souls. So again, the direct reference to Greeks becomes very almost funny uh, and amusing in a nice way because obviously it references to the Homeric landscape, the Homeric political and cultural climate from where this particular word is borrowed. Oh, rocks, she said, tell us in plain words. He smiled, glancing askance at the mocking eyes, the some, the some same young eyes, the first night after the chariots, dolphins bonds. He turned over the smudged pages. Ruby, the pride of the king. Hello, illustration, fierce Italian with carriage whip. Must be a ruby pride on the, on the, on the, on the, on the floor naked. Sheet kindly lent. The monster Maffei desisted and flung his victim from him with an oath. Cruelty behind it all. Doped animals, trapeze and hanglers had to look at the other way. Mob gaping, break your neck and will break your sides. Families of them, born them young, so they met of psychosis. Then we live after death, our souls, that a man's soul after he dies. Dignum's soul. So this entire passage becomes a series of uh, streams of associations or streams of consciousness, very associated streams of consciousness. The, he looks into her eyes and thinks of some of the memories uh, of courting when they first met and then it goes on forever to certain events that they witnessed together and then the whole idea of soul comes in and the reference to Dignam, the dead man, uh, comes back again, Dignam's soul. Did you finish it? He asks. Yes, she said. It's something, and there's nothing uh, smutty about it. Is he in the love with the first fellow all the time? Never read it. Do you want another? He has getting a Paul de Knox. Nice name he has. She poured more tea into a cup, watching it flow sideways. Uh, some people believe, he said, that we go on living in another body after death, that we live before. So this is the idea of reincarnation in a metaphysical way. They call it reincarnation, that we all lived before on the earth thousands of years ago or some other planet. They say we have forgotten it. Some say they remember their past lives. The sluggish cream warned curdling spirals through her tea. Betty reminded her of the word, 
metempsychosis. An example would be better. An example, the battle of the nymph over the bed, given away with the eastern number of 40 bits, splendid masterpiece in art colors. Again, the battle of the nymph is a homeric illusion over here. It's a, it's a painting which is obviously Grecian in quality, Greek in quality, and that again connects it in a very interesting structural way to the original Homer story. T before you put milk in, not unlike her with the hair down, slimmer, three and six a gift for the frame. She said it would look nice over the bread. Naked nymphs, Greece, again the reference to Greece is important, and for instance all the people that lived then. He turned the pages back, metempsychosis, he said, is what the ancient Greeks called it. They used to believe that you could be changed into an animal or a tree, for instance, what they call nymphs, for example. Right, so he's trying to give an example, and the obvious example comes as a as a Grecian example, a Greek example, a Hellenic example, which has been delivered over here. And that obviously connects the modern Ulysses, the Dublin Ulysses, to the original Hellenic myth. Right? So, metempsychosis is a very metaphysical transition or transposition or transmutation of souls, which has been talked about. Okay. Her spoon ceased to stir up the sugar. She gazed straight before her, inhaling through her arched nostrils. There's a smell of burn, she said. Did you leave some, anything on the fire? The kidney, he cried suddenly. He fitted the book roughly into the inner pocket and, stubbing his toes against a broken commode, hurried out towards the smell, stepping hastily down the stairs with a florid stalk's legs. Pungent smoke shot up in an angry jet from the side of a pan. By prodding a prong of the, a prong of the fork under the kidney, he detached it and turned it turtle on his back. Only a little burnt. He tossed it off the pan onto the plate and let the scanty brown gravy trickle over it. Cup of tea now. Uh, uh, he sat down, cut and buttered a slice of the loaf. He shore away the burnt flesh and flung it to the cat. Then he put a forkful into his mouth, chewing with discernment the tooth stump pliant meat. Done to a turn, a mouthful of tea. Then he cut away dies of bread, sopped away, sopped one in the gravy and put it in his mouth. What was that? Some young student on a picnic. He, he creased out the letter at his side, reading it slowly as it chewed, sopping another die of bread in the gravy and raising it to his mouth. So again, I stop at this point today, but the point is, look at the way in which uh, something profound, something spiritual, something metaphysical is very cut back into, uh, the interrupted and cut back into this very immediate reality of a burning kidney, right? So again, the burning kidney becomes a marker of this immediate reality, this vulgar reality, this consumable reality, the visceral reality which is exactly what is foregrounded throughout the novels. We have the spiritual insights, this metaphysical discussions, this metaphysical forays and the discussions about life, death, art, spirituality, religion. But the gritty realism of Dublin, uh, the immediate reality of Dublin is never quite si lost sight of. So the burning kidney becomes the metaphor of the you know, immediate reality that is pervading the entire novel of Ulysses. So this discussion about metapsychosis, about something becoming something else, uh, is very flippantly parried away uh, when a kidney is about to get burnt. Uh, the meat kidney, which is supposed to be consumed, is about to get charred. Uh, and that would not be metapsychosis, that would be just a burning, which would be inedible. Right? So it just, the, the interesting combination is very, very uh, interesting to look at. We have this spiritual combination, the spiritual transition of souls into one another, when you have this visceral, dirty, immediate, vulgar, transition of meat into a burnt thing which will not be consumed, which cannot be consumed anymore. And that combination of the profound and the flippant, uh, the mystical and the material is something which Ulysses carries on doing throughout his entire narrative. And we see more of these uh, instances and times to come as we move on to next sections. But we we'll stop at this point today and we we'll continue with Ulysses in the next lectures. Thank you for your attention.